computers. <laughs> but life was much simpler. The old ways are going. And so the history that we showed today with Bob Rezac, Chad, Roger Smart, we wish to preserve for all of you, your children, and your children's children, so that when the lashes of Lone Wolf are buried on the prairie, they may come here and enjoy what you have enjoyed and see the things that you have seen and honor those who are gone. I look upon the faces of Steve Sark, John, Many of us go way back. Bless her, Branson. Stories. Uh -huh. Did I ever tell you why the white caps are upon the You know where punch for this. Two warriors went upon a hunting trip. They needed venison for the squaws and the little ones, the papooses. They had a hard time. There was no deer in the gullies and the glens. The antelope was gone from the forest, and buffalo were scarce to be seen. First day they traveled, they found nothing. And they continued. Second day, Little game was seen. They were gone for, oh, seven days. No food for the village. Winter was coming, cold. They needed food. They were getting tired. They were getting weak. And all of a sudden, upon the ground, <coughs> dull knife saw some eggs. Dull Knife said to his brother, Two Moon, Two Moon, let us eat these eggs and get strong. And Two Moon said, No, Dull Knife, this is sacred. Do not touch that. Do not eat that. But Dull Knife's stomach growled. He was hungry. So he broke the eggs and ate them. They continued on their journey. And finally they found deer and shot two deer, cleaned the deer, cut it up into jerky, smoked it. Two, three day, they prepared the deer to haul back. But each day that they worked, dull knife became stiff. His hands could not work. He could not walk. He said to Two Moon, Two Moon, there's something wrong. My hand is stiff. I cannot walk with it. I hurt and I'm sore. Dull Knife said, well, what do I do? Two Moon said, I told you. It must be something with those eggs wrong for you to eat them. Well, I have already eaten them. What are we to do? Let us finish the deer and go back to the village. We are about two weeks away, and we must carry all this food and drag it. As they started back, each mile became harder. Bone knife became slower. Night would come, Dull Knife was cold and chilled. Two Moon built fire, they sat close by. He wrapped his blanket, whatever he had, around Dull Knife. In the morning, when the sun came out and glistened, Two Moon jumped back! He looked, and there, upon Dull Knife's arms, sparkled in the sun, 
like iridescent crystals. What is this? What is this? Your skin is changing. It is shining in the sun like a crystal. Iridescent. Don't like said, I do not know. And they started back on that journey that day again. And each time, the two moon looked at Dull Knife. His skin kept changing in the iridescent color. They made camp that night. Two moon covered him with blankets by the fire, <coughs> gave him food. Afraid to walk on Tonkan, the great spirit. Morning, dull knife could hardly move. He could hardly walk. Now there's a choice. Do I carry my brother dull knife and leave the food, or do I bring the food and come back for dull knife? My brother is sick. I will leave the food high up in the tree so the bears will not get it on a rope, <coughs> and I will. <coughs> take Dull Knife back to the shaman of our <coughs> tribe and see if he can make medicine in the deep forest and make well for my brother. And so, Two Moon picked up Dull Knife, carried him all that day. That night again they camped. In the morning, <coughs> All of a sudden, two moons heard this. horrified, but he heard the language, the talk of the snake. Two moons, take me to Bad Axel's lake. Two moons picked up Dull Knife in horror, but he was his brother. To the shores over by Isle of Dreams. Now the body of Dull Knife, the legs were one. It was like the tail of a snake. resemblance to his brother, but that of a giant serpent. He laid them on the shore of the water. Dull knife slithered in to the lake. And then the head popped up, that of a giant viper, and said, So when you look out upon Bad Axe and you see the white caps breaking above the water, do not be afraid. It is only Dull Knife hunting for food. And as his serpent body slides in and out of the waves, making the white caps that we see on the stormy days. There was a time, too, and that's in the beginning of time, in the dawn of time, when the grass was young, the wind was free, 
When a warrior could ride from sun up to sundown, and the only voice he heard was that of Wakan Takan talking to him. There was many things in the forest. And the forest has been good to us. And so, I wish you the benediction. Life is like the flash of a firefly at night, the breath of a buffalo in the winter time, the small shadow that races across the prairie towards the setting sun. May he who is one and who is many, may he who is seen and unseen, may he who is the wind and the moon and the spars, put sunshine into all your hearts until we meet again. outfits that uh, rotted off. <laughs> All the beadwork that you see, everything I've done myself except for the Voyager sash, Les Francais, my uh, relatives, the Chabonneau and the Manettes, we're French-Canadian Voyager, and so I wear the Voyager sash. But as far as uh, all the beadwork, it took me four years to do all my beadwork. The hides I bought and then made into the war shirt and the leggings. So people have asked me to loan it, and I said no. no. <laughs> if you are dedicated to go out and tell the stories and the legends of the people in the land, you will be dedicated enough to make your own outfit. Some people will say, oh, you have a beautiful costume. I said no. I don't have a costume. I have a war shirt, leggings, the four wind symbols of the Ogallala Sioux. I am not here for Halloween. The only American holiday the Indians or the white men follow is Halloween, where they go out trick or treat. Joke. <laughs> 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 so, any questions before I leave? Because I only come out about two or three times a year, is the only time. So, if anybody has a question, I'd be more than happy to answer it now. There were two stories? <laughs> <laughs> you come back for the hundredth and I'll be here maybe. <laughs> Thank you for Thank coming. You. Yes, Thank, you. Thank all of you. It's a pleasure. Uh, Mrs. Well, we'll say this is Don Carlson. It's um, January 22nd. And um, Bob Rezac's here, and I'm Chad Swenson. And uh, we invited Don to come, or we asked, invited ourselves to come over to Don's house and videotape a little bit of what he remembers. And we have some questions. And, and um, one of the things, too, you know, we can do this in multiple different ones. So if, I'm assuming everybody's going to love this and they're going to want part two and part three. Oh. <laughs> Well, there's not too many of us left for part two and part three. <laughs> no, 
Well, you go according to your format there, and I don't know if I can help you much, but I remember a few things, so where do we start, uh, Bob? Well, we'll just uh, kind of go down down the line here on our on our, on our interview questions okay. here, and uh, uh, I'm not sure if we've got them in any particular order, uh, but uh, we'll just go. We'll just run with it and see what uh, see what, how we, what we can come up with. Um, uh, where was your hometown, Don? Where are you originally from? Well, I was born in Minneapolis, and we uh, moved after the war. I was young, we moved to Fergus Falls, and uh, I was in my early elementary school in Fergus Falls at Lincoln, we lived out in West Beach, and Fergus Falls, and then uh, in 1953, we moved to Fargo, and I was 10 years old when we moved to Fargo, and I remember the move because uh, we rented a house on 10th Street South, and the house belonged to a gentleman by the name of Lloyd Ogren. And Lloyd Ogren was a professional scouter in the Red River Valley Council at that time. And we needed a place to stay. Well, he was on staff at Wilderness Camps. Back then it was called Wilderness Camps. So uh, we rented the house for that summer, and then uh, my uncle was a professional scouter also. He had graduated from Moorhead State, Harlan Wizard White. So uh, he was up at Wilderness Camps with my Aunt Gloria, and so he invited me to come up there for the summer. So my first summer was uh, summer of 53 at Wilderness Camps, and that's uh, where I met a few, a few of the gentlemen there that, that I vaguely remember. And uh, one of them, uh, one of them was uh, Vern Lindsay was his name. He was a man of short height but tall in stature. He had a full beard and he uh, smoked a curve Mershman pipe. He had the smoky bear hat with a large first class symbol on it. And he was one of the first lodge chiefs for the Minnedoodle Lodge. And he was on camp staff for a number of years. And he's, he's gone now. Yeah, there's over 40 of them that are gone that I can name off. But uh, he uh, kind of took me under his wing and showed me around the camp. And my uncle, of course, uh, being a professional uh, district uh, exec, he was there and showed me around. And then uh, I donated to camp. Uh, my uncle had went out and found Diamond Willow and made a large picture frame about this size by about this size and the fellow that was on the swimming beach that was in charge of the swimming beach was a guy by the name of Fred Retzloff. And Fred Retzloff, the Retzloffs are quite known in South Dakota. His, his brother Pete Retzloff played in for the Philadelphia Eagles and uh, quite known. In fact, they did an article here in Neighbors here within the last couple months on uh, the Retzlaff family. Well, anyway, uh, Fred, he did a, a watercolor of Scout Beach back then. And it was like this size here and about like this size. And my uncle found the diamond willow and they made the frame for it. And I held on that for years and years and years. And then when we had the was it the 50th or 55 or something? Reunion up there at Camp Wilderness, which it's now called. I asked the ranger, I said, if he would be interested in having some memorabilia come back, because a lot of it was thrown away or disappeared over the years and was never found. So uh, I, I told him the story that I'm telling you about this diamond willow frame and the watercolor painting, and he said, God, I'd love to have that. So. I've donated that, and I talked to Roger Smart, and he tells me it's now hanging in the dining hall. So that makes me feel real good. That were, uh, yep. I, I guess I remember it in uh, it was in the Winter Trading Post for a little it while. It was, but it's it? moved. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's new home is now the dining hall. See, what you got to keep in mind is that over the years, the scout office was always in, well, it moved two or three times from the Red River Valley to different locations, and then where it's down there now... Uh, down by the uh, park.
park. But as uh, the console increased in size and became bigger and units and more, their filing spaces were limited down there. So basically, a new exec would come in and he would call through and, uh, well, we don't need this and we don't need that. And they would throw all that stuff in the dumpster. And there was a professional scouter by the name of Mark Kepenick, and he was an amateur photographer, black and white film. And he took thousands, thousands of slides of pictures of Camp Wilderness in black and white. Uh, well, Forrest Davis, he was the professional that was cleaning out the one day that I was there. And I said, well, I said, uh, you know, this is kind of history of the camp. Do you mind if I climb in the dumpster and pull some of this out? So I said, no, go ahead. So I climbed in the dumpster and salvaged as much as I could. And these were pictures of every campsite and every activity and everything that was happening with the, the, with the scouts and, uh, and the governor of Minnesota that had been there, uh, Young Doll, I think, I can't remember now. And uh, then I gave a lot of these pictures to this fellow here, what's his name, John DeWord, that wrote this yeah. book in 96. So I gave him all the black and whites that I had, and I said, you know, use them for the book, and you keep them and, uh, what, for posterity because there were so many that were gone but oh, there was a, a number of slides and then too uh, am I off the track here off your off your sheet or am I just rambling no no <laughs> no whatever whatever you have to say you know, go ahead I got a mission for you there Chad and this can be done today with a man that's proficient and competent and has maybe an hour maybe but in my time, three-fourths of scouting was outing. We did a lot of camping and a lot of pioneering and a lot of work. And uh, over the years, uh, back in the early years of wilderness camp, we always invited a foreign scouter or scout to come to camp with us for the summer. And he'd